tonight, uh, we're talking about class. And, um, you know, for, to, to my mind, I think, uh, you know, I've been an activist for a long time, uh, not as long as some of you, but, uh, you know, I've uh, been around. Uh, and I was just thinking about the 1987 march on Washington uh, earlier today, which was one of the first things that I was involved in. Were you at the march? Yeah. yeah, of course you were. Um, and uh, also my work with ACT UP in the early days. And, you know, whenever we would do one of these big marches or actions, we would always think about what are our demands. You know, we would have a demands list, um, all the things that we were looking for. And, uh, and through consensus decision-making processes, we would arrive at a, a, a long list of uh, things that were very inclusive um, and, and very broad in their thinking and always in my experience, we would look at uh, questions of economic justice and how uh, how that intersects and affects so many different components of the LGBTQ uh, communities. And so, uh, uh, and also historically, I think it's important to note that um, leaders in the gay community, politicians, uh, going back to Harvey Milk and Harry Brett, who's here. Um, uh, worked very hard to uh, um, uh, deal with issues like rent control, around uh, speculation, around real estate in San Francisco. Um, and, I, and I think that there is something potentially very special about uh, San Francisco and the queer community, but I, uh, my own personal assessment is uh, that if the queer community um, had hoped to uh, lead an effort to create a more uh, economically just uh, country, we have failed. Um, and uh, 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 just looking at the data, you know, uh, nationally uh, and really internationally, because it's not just a San Francisco issue, um, the, the gap between the rich and the poor continues to widen. Uh, the poor become more poor um, and the rich become more rich. And uh, the 1% is now getting down to 0.1%, I think. Um, and we're looking at, uh, of course, the effects, uh, the residual effects of that on the streets of San Francisco every day. Um, I live right across the street over here, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, uh, sometimes, you know, on, on a given day, it's, it makes me sad. On another day, it'll make me angry. Another day, I'll just be in denial, and some days, I'll just shut down. But there's always like an emotional response, uh, if not immediate, then later to see the suffering um, in the streets of San Francisco. And at the same time, you know, I ride public transportation, but I, you know, I can go to uh, neighborhoods uh, around the city and see the most extreme wealth that you won't find anywhere in the world. And so, um, I guess the questions that we're going to try to do, what we're going to try to do is solve that tonight. No. What we're going to try to do uh, is, 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 dis is discuss these disparities um, in, in a way that tries to put it in a historical context. What, what role has the queer community played um, in uh, uh, advancing social justice with, with regard to economics and housing? And, 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 uh, and what role does it play today? Or in what role should it play? So um, I'm going to want to introduce our um, panelists just by reading their very brief files. Thank you everyone for contributing these very briefly. <laughs> um, and because they all have a long and much richer experience than I'm able to talk about here, of course. Uh, uh, Claire Farley um, is a senior advisor to the mayor and executive director of the Office of Transgender Initiatives with the city and county of San Francisco. A human rights and transgender rights advocate, she also worked for over a decade leading economic development and employment programs at the San Francisco LGBT Center. She received the 2017 Outstanding Voices Award from the San Francisco Business Times and was recognized as a soldier of social change by San Francisco Magazine. Uh, Ruth Mahaney currently teaches at City College of San Francisco in the field of LGBTQ studies, especially LGBTQ history. She served, I'm getting to say that so quickly now, I didn't be cute. She almost just went right off. Time to add another letter. She served on the board of directors of the GLBT Historical Society for 20 years and, and, collective, thank you, and collective member of the Modern Times Bookstore for 35 years. Ruth has lived in San Francisco since 1971, grew up in a working class family, and has participated in leftist groups and causes since the 1960s. 
At age 73, she is active in old lesbians organizing for change. Mm. Should it be older? No. No, okay. We are all. Southern Italian queer activist, activist from South Philly who works at the Housing Rights Committee, helping to stop evictions, displacement, and gentrification throughout the city. In his spare time, he is a performing artist, writer, and singer songwriter. With Allison Wright, he is the co author of A Roof Over My Head, a musical about the San Francisco housing crisis that will be performed as part of the National Queer Arts Festival on June 10th. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Julie Nice heads constitutional sector. Sexuality and Poverty Law at the University of San Francisco School of Law, where she is the Herbst Foundation Professor of Law. She writes regularly about LGBTQ rights and economic justice. She has won 14 awards for teaching excellence and was for teaching excellence and was featured as one of the nation's top 25 law teachers in what the best law teachers do. Probably mm -hmm. 2013. She began her legal career representing impoverished clients as a public interest litigator in Chicago. Andrea Shorter has resided in San Francisco for nearly 28 years, mainly in the Castro. Her journey as an LGBTQ advocate has developed alongside her passion for women's rights, adverse youth empowerment, and criminal and ju uh, juvenile justice reform. She has worked with many social justice organizations and has even co-founded some. Since 2000, she has served on the Commission of the Status of Women for the City and County of San Francisco. So thank you. Uh, so the format of tonight's uh, conversation um, will be that we're uh, going to just give each uh, of the panelists an opportunity to talk for five to ten minutes about um, whatever they want to talk about um, relevant to this subject, of course. And uh, and then I'm probably going to throw out a few questions just to stimulate some conversation among them. I hope. And uh, towards the end, we should have about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I think we're wrapping up at 9 mm -hmm. o'clock um, uh, to take questions from the audience. Okay? Who wants to go first? Tommy, yay, you can ask for it. So, um, just to give you a quick background um, beyond what Terry mentioned. Um, I was born into poverty in an immigrant Italian neighborhood in South Philly. We lived in my grandfather's house, which he had bought with his earnings as a boot black, which is also known as a shoe shy person. He shined shoes all his life. That's what he did until he died. Um, Papa, who operated a gas station with my uncle, eventually got us into our own working class row house in South Philly. If you know South Philly, it's all row houses that are connected to each other. All my life, I have been working class and fucking proud of it. <laughs> it's interesting that we're doing this discussion at the same time, and maybe even it's going on now, that our mayor is launching raids on tent encampments in the mission. The reality is that there are no shelter beds available this time. There's a waiting list of over 1,000 just for a friggin' shelter bed. There's no affordable housing available for homeless people, only wait lists and lots of promises. Meanwhile, the city continues to build more and more market rate and luxury condos, many of which will remain empty because they're bought by investors who only want them as investment property and don't give a damn about housing anybody. I may sound bitter and cynical, but that's because the situation we're in is one that invokes bitterness and cynicism. Homelessness is the most visible manifestation of the economic in inequity in our country, and our city, and our LGBT community, I'm sorry to say. It's, it has hit our community hard. Two homeless people, one trans, one gay male, both people of color, have died on the streets of the Castro in recent years, not far from here, okay? 49% of homeless youth in San Francisco identify as LGBT. 49%, that's almost one half. 29% of the general homeless population identify as LGBT, 
Two Williams Institute studies show that our community is as poor as, and in some cases, poorer than other communities. A National Lesbian and Gay Task Force and National Coalition on Homelessness study showed a few years ago that nationally, 20 to 40 percent of homeless youth identify as LGBT. Is this upsetting you as much as it upsets me to read this to you? Two women of color, a couple, were among those displaced during the sweeps before the Super Bowl came to town. Remember the Super Bowl? One of the women lost her job as a result of the sweeps. The response within our community? Yeah. Yeah. You could hear a pin drop. Okay? It's not like when AIDS struck our community in 1981. It's not like when people suddenly wanted gay marriage. I've been doing housing and homeless, working on housing and homeless issues here in San Francisco for 20 years. 20 long years. Starting in the late 90s when the first dot-com boom hit and it caused countless evictions of gay men with AIDS and LGBT homeless to soar in the Castro. I and others, including Jim Matulski, then pastor of MCC, set up three winter shelters, a sit-down meal three nights a week, and a place for homeless people to shower. The opposition from merchants and neighbors, queer and straight, was disheartening to say the least. I've been involved in the queer community since 1971. I have never been so angered in my life as I was during the discussions and the forums on setting up a shelter, for Christ's sakes, for people to come in out of the cold. One lesbian woman who opposed the shelter, she opposed it because her kids were going to get cooties. Mm -hmm. I swear, she used that word, mm -hmm. cooties, from homeless youth. Our youth, right? Mm -hmm. About two years ago, I and others succeeded in setting up Jazzy's Place, an LGBT adult shelter in the mission it really upsets me to say this, but we had first approached then Supervisor Wiener about having a similar shelter in the Castro, and we were turned down. David Campos, who was the queer supervisor in the mission, was more than happy to help us establish something in the mission. And then we set up Marty's Place, a residence for homeless and formerly homeless people with AIDS, also in the mission. It wasn't much these efforts. Seriously, not much. But we had to work like hell just to get these little things to give a little bit of relief to just a few people. Jazzy's Place has only 24 beds. Marty's Place houses six to nine people. Just to get that, I can't tell you the hell we went through. Um, and, and there was virtually no support from mainstream queer organizations for either of those projects. Our community, on the other hand, raised over $43 million to fight Prop 8, the statewide anti-gay marriage initiative. I'm not saying we shouldn't have fought that initiative, but I'm saying $43 million. We raised countless millions to, to win the right to marry. Again, not against marriage, but we raised millions and millions of dollars. How much have we raised to fight poverty and homelessness in our community? I don't know the figure, but it's sure ain't $43 million. We should, be, we should have prioritized the gay marriage and fighting poverty and homelessness in our community. There's no reason we couldn't have done both, but we didn't. So what can we do? Okay, I've told you the problem, okay? I'll just throw out some ideas. Hopefully you'll, read, you'll ask me about them, there'll be discussion on the panel about them. Mainstream organizations that have resources and money such as Human Rights Campaign and Equality California need to invest money and their political influence in ending poverty and homelessness in our community. We need a war on poverty. Absolutely, right? It's a no-brainer. Everyone needs to stop supporting the criminalization of poverty and, poverty and homelessness because it is the single most destructive thing to homeless and poor people in this city. We have sit-line, we have anti-panhandling measures, and a whole bunch of other measures 
that criminalize people. And as a housing person, I can tell you, if you get a lot of citations for sit lie, and you don't pay them, which most people don't because they don't have the money, duh, right? It goes to a bench warrant. A cop stops you, and what happens? Yeah, you have a criminal record. What happens if you go to, to rent a unit that is subsidized with federal money? You get denied. And then my organization, we have to spend time to, to request a grievance hearing and to advocate for that person to get them into housing. Time that we could be spending helping people fight evictions. But we have to be helping because Gavin Newsom wanted to be mayor of second term, and so he pushed to sit live off. That's what it was all about, right? So because of that, and I can tell you for a fact that a lot of the people who are getting these criminal records, especially in the hate, are LGBT youth. So we've done this for our own youth by voting for sit live. Um, the police are not the solution. They should never be interacting with the homeless unless there's a crime that's been committed. We, we need people who are trained to deal with homeless people, and that should be these outreach workers, these invis invisible, mythical outreach workers we hear about that the hot team supposedly puts on our streets. Um, they should be dealing with it. We should be demanding more outreach workers, more services, and most important of all, affordable housing in our neighborhood, the Castro. And we don't have any in the pipeline for this neighborhood. Um, I'll rush ahead because I know I'm talking a lot. We need a drop-in center in the Castro. Why don't we have a place where if somebody's hungry or a, a senior doesn't have enough money to buy groceries that week, they can go and there's a food pantry and they can get food. Or someone just arrived in town and they're young and they're going to be homeless and they want some resources. They want to know where Jazzy's place is. Or they want a meal. Or they want to store some things in a storage bin or take a shower. Why don't we have a place like that in our neighborhood? It's the least we can do for our community. Why is that controversial? When we approached Scott Winter about that, he was like, hell no, the neighbors are globalistic. I can't do that. Right? Why? Why is that controversial? Why is it controversial, for Christ's sakes, to give somebody a place to shower, to give them the dignity of a meal and a shower? Why is that controversial? We need to be supporting and working with groups like the Coalition of Homelessness. We need to fight evictions, gentrification, and market rate housing. Evictions cause homelessness. I, I can tell you from experience that, there, that a lot of people who are homeless on the streets are homeless because they were evicted. Two friends of mine who were queer became homeless when they got evicted. Okay, we need to support the fight for a living wage. I don't even have to explain that. You all know why that is. We need to fight the money that is coming to the city, the money from people like Ron Conway, who are using it to gentrify our city, to change our city, to elect moderate politicians that don't have the interest of poor and working class people. We are in dire straits, folks. History will either see us as a model of caring for homeless and poor people in our community, as it did back in the 80s, when we were fighting AIDS, or they will, they will see us as having failed to take care of those who have the least among us, the most vulnerable. Is that the legacy we want? Is that the legacy of our error? That we didn't do what we could do to help poor and homeless people in our community? We are family, right? Isn't that what we used to believe? Well, you know what? I'm sorry, I don't see it. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Yes. So I did visuals just because I'm a visual learner. Can everyone hear me in the back? If not, I'll use the mic. Um, Actually, this is a great for new video. If you use the microphone. Sure. Let's see. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Claire Farley. Um, it's an honor to be here and to celebrate the museum and the importance to really look at our history. Um, as Tommy mentioned, you know, we are in a state of crisis. Um, in my work at the LGBT Center for the last decade, I was working with homeless and poor and marginally housed LGBT folks who were trying to survive in our city. And I think often there is this myth of gay affluence um, or, you know, no kids to adults' income. 
Um, but if we really look at the history of what our movement was, it's always come from the resistance and this family that John was speaking of where we fight back and get counted. Um, I just did a quick figure of uh, what San Francisco's budget um, is, um, and it's close to nine billion. Um, and, you know, as an LGBT community, there's really no clear way to say how much of those resources are going to support um, the LGBT community. And so part of my work and part of our office's work at the Trans Initiatives is to really look at equity across the board and to work with city departments and partners across the city to say that if 49% of our young people uh, who are LGBT are on the streets, then we need to make sure that those resources are being allocated to support our communities. Um, if 29% of adults are homeless, um, what is the homeless department doing to really address those issues? And so um, in my work as an advocate, I really did see in partnering with the city as a funder that there was more work that I could do from within the city to help advocate for change. Um, you know, I continue to be the only trans person in the space or continue to be the only queer person in the space. And so, you know, my hope, um, and I hope we get to talk about it today, is how do we lift each other up and create more LGBT leaders in the city? Um, because if we look at our history, you know, we have all these amazing places that we've lost, right? I mean, this museum celebrates um, you know, where we used to come together as a queer family, you know, Compton's Cafeteria, and also in that play, which has been running through the Tenderloin Museum, um, and I get to play Vicki Starlight, who, um, Vicki Marlene, who was a legendary performer, um, and Aunt Charlie's, and has performed um, throughout the city um, until her passing, and, you know, these are the community members that helped lead the Compton Cafeteria riots. Um, you know, our neighborhoods, you know, queer people are all over the city, and we continue to see these resources lost. And so how are we working to make sure that we're preserving both where we came from, but the organizations that sustain us, the events that build us forward? Um, I worked to advocate for Trans Day of Visibility because the only day that we really had to honor trans people was Trans Day of Remembrance. And, you know, it's <coughs> important that we honor those that we've lost. Um, last year, we lost 29 transgender people to murder and violence um, across the country, over 350 to 400 internationally that we can count. Um, 90 to 95 percent of those deaths were trans women of color. And so if we're not telling the truth, if we're not speaking up, as Tommy mentioned, then those names get forgotten. But we also need to celebrate our resistance because the people that came before us, you know, Harvey Milk, uh, we just honored the naming of Harvey Milk Terminal last week. You know, Miss Major, who's legendary, and Marsha P. Johnson, these are the leaders, Cecilia Chung, Roma Guy, Del Martin, that have fueled our movement, and so we are those change makers now, and so there is a responsibility for us to all come to the table and do the work. Um, there isn't time to wait. Um, if we look at the numbers, 60% um, of trans people in San Francisco reported to make under 15000 annually. 40% um, don't have a bank account. 25% are only working uh, full time um, and three times as likely to be unemployed than in the general population, four times for trans people of color. Um, and then we see that 90% of trans people who are working experience harassment in the workplace. So, as colleagues and people that we work with, trans folks or who work with my community, you know, I ask you to help lift up and support trans people who are in, in your workplace because it's necessary not only to hire us, but to help support us um, in staying um, in pathways towards economic stability. Because if we don't have employment, how do we keep housing? Um, if we don't have housing, how do we continue to work? Um, and so 
through our office and partnership with a lot of people at this table, um, you know, we're really looking at how do we address both homelessness, um, and I'll let Andrea talk about some of the work we've been doing together, but really thinking about how do we actually grow. I mean, 20 beds at Jazzy's place is not enough. So, you know, we really do need as many voices to ask for more LGBT housing. Um, hopefully in the future, there'll be um, in the works a youth uh, uh, navigation center. Um, but we need voices to continue to make sure that we have housing for our community because it's the number one issue um, impacting our folks. And then lastly, I'll say is that we did a, um, uh, last night we had our first trans advisory um, committee, which is a, one of the first boards um, through the mayor's office um, that I appointed of leaders across the, across the community to really lift up the, the needs of the community. And so I really encourage us to, is like looking at this table, it's like when we're talking about class and race, we have to recognize our own privilege. Um, and as a white trans woman, I recognize my privilege in talking about race and class. <coughs> so I think it's important that we recognize that you know, this panel is largely white and that we have to continue to advocate and make sure that we're creating spaces and conversations for our, our community at large. So with that, I'll turn it over. Um, so, I'm Bertha Haney, and I also, um, I teach at City College, um, and so I'm you know, trying to put these issues together all the time, and I know that um, our program at City College has actually, I think, more homeless um, students in it than any other program in the college, so it's like we're, you know, I just want to reinforce what Tommy said about that. Um, in thinking about, so how do I think about class? I love talking about class. Um, one of the, the issues I think is um, I come from an era of identity politics where you know we uh, learn to identify as um, as a community, as a group. And um, I think about uh, you know identity politics around class, and that we in fact don't have an identity politics movement based on the issue of class. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, I, I would love to see us do that again. I remember back in the '70s, we used to talk about class a lot, and we sort of stopped. Um, and I think that's not a good thing. Um, so I was thinking, okay, so what's our agenda as we think about what, as a movement, I consider myself part of a movement, a broad and sometimes specific movement. So what's our agenda? Um, and and what's, a, what's a queer issue? Um, and I used to teach in women's studies for years and that was a battle all the time there. Like, what's a women's issue? And we only want to look at women's issues. Um, and, you know, I was always really alarmed because it's like, well, women are in, you know, all classes, all races, all, you know, disability, that, you know, all those things, ages. Um, so, and so are queer people. So, um, all the issues are, I think, of as queer issues. And certainly poverty needs to be a queer issue. Um, as it is also a women's issue, I think. So, um, one issue that's always been really important to me is that um, I do not want my liberation to come at the expense of someone else's oppression. And I feel like we're tempted by that all the time. Um, and, you know, I think just in my own come to understanding um, you know, issues around the protection of women, which has been used as the protection of white women, which was used to 
demonize and criminalize black men um, historically. Um, the issue of abortion, getting abortion, you know, I counsel for abortions when it was a felony to do so. Um, I think it's really important to have abortion available and accessible. Um, but at the same time, that movement did get used to um, promote sterilization of women, uh, of some women, and the you know, forced abortions or very encouraged abortions um, for some women um, because they were in a, a race and a class that the ruling class didn't want so many of those people. So, um, and then we all know the examples of uh, uh, Nazi Germany uh, sort of choosing the least popular group um, and taking away the civil rights of that group and then that sort of softens up the population for the taking away another group's civil rights and you know it grew from there. Um, and we used that example ourselves in 1978. Um, and so I want to talk about 1978 for a minute and Hopefully, I can make the connection. But um, so we're at 40 years of 1978 and the election of 1978. Um, we use that example of Nazi Germany um, using a phrase for Proposition 6. Everybody know what Proposition 6 was? So, 6 was um, a statewide proposition that was basically. Um, saying that if you were a school teacher who was found out to be gay or thought to be gay or supported or spoke out in favor of gay rights, you must be fired. You may not have contact with children, i.e. school children, and so if you were in the school systems, you must be fired. That was a statewide proposition in 1978 on the ballot. Um, and just the connection with the Nazi Germany, um, we, we used a phrase that said, who's next on a lot of our publicity, saying basically the, you know, the old phrase of first they came for the gypsies, I wasn't gypsy, so I, I didn't speak up, then they came for the Jews, I wasn't, so I didn't speak up, and then they came for the communists. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak up. So that's the, the sort of, frame, and we used that um, for when we argued against Proposition 6, saying, you know, they're picking on us now, they could pick on any of us next, you know, who's next. Um, so we won that. We fought really hard. Um, I think we did a really brilliant campaign. I think we, you know, did a lot really important work around um, Proposition 6, and we won. And it was like 58% or something that we won by. Um, however, um, there were on that ballot some other things that we did not win. And um, I want to talk about two of them. Um, one of them was Proposition 7. Does anybody know what that was? No. Um, Proposition 7 was the death penalty. Now, Proposition 7 was written by the same guy that wrote Proposition 6, John Briggs, who, in my opinion, was a sort of idiot um, for uh, Orange County. Uh, he was a state legislator, and he wrote Proposition 6 as part of the anti-gay um, Anita Bryant Save Our Children campaign that was going all over the country and had succeeded in many parts of the country and they were like taking on what they called the moral garbage dump of the nation, which was San Francisco in their opinion. Uh, so it was sort of their big, their big game was to do this in San Francisco. Um, the the uh, progressive energy of the entire state 
went into defeating John Briggs in Proposition 6. And I'm grateful to our allies. We had a lot of allies who were not gay, who sided with us, who understood this was really a bad attack, and who were with us. But it meant that we didn't pay attention to Proposition 7. There were groups, and lesbian school workers here in San Francisco was one of the groups that tried to combine the two issues and say, defeat both Briggs initiatives. Um, I, I do have friends that live in the black community who said that at the time when they brought up the Briggs initiative, people thought it was the death penalty initiative because that community understood the dangers of bringing back the death penalty. We were a non-death penalty state before 1978. And um, so they understood and, and were really worried about Briggs. But the, the progressive allies in the state were so focused on six that I think you know seven really did not get the kind of attention that it should have gotten. And it passed by 78%. Um, and I just want to read one little thing I found in a paper from uh, 1978. Um, where Briggs, they say, um, Senator John Briggs, who also authored Proposition 6, this is about how the death penalty passed, um, says, um, uh, he, he proved to be right in predicting his death penalty measure would slip by virtually unnoticed. Um, I'll be known as the man who ran Proposition 6 um, so I could get Proposition 7 through without a fight. That's his quote from this guy. So it, it was not an accident you know, that this happened. Um, so I, you know, I feel like my liberation in some ways went at the expense of someone else's um, oppression. And um, I don't like it. And uh, so the next time we, we've been trying, people have been trying to um, reverse the death penalty and um, withdraw it from the state. And um, I feel like I want to be part of trying to make that happen because you know, I don't want to be in this position. The other thing I want to just call attention to from that very same year um, is uh, Proposition 13. And it is one of the reasons that our school system has slipped to, what, 47 now in the, in the country? 47th by states. There's only 50 states. Uh, so, uh, you know, because Prop 13, which was a tax initiative, it, it was actually in, um, in June, um, there was a, you know, election. The other two were in November of 78. But June of 78, Proposition 13 passed, and it passed big time again. Um, and it passed two thirds, I think, 67% or something. Um, so, and what that basically did was refigure the tax base that instead of it being based on um, the market value of property, it was to be based on the assessed value, um, which was usually often much lower and was tied to the pr um, price at uh, purchase instead of what it had become. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people that was sold to us based on, you know, my grandmother has a house and it keeps going up in value and she can't afford the taxes anymore. Um, so that was how it was sold to us. But it benef who it benefited was the um, corporate offices, the you know, large companies that um, have not had to pay their share of taxes. So the taxes, I think, was something like 94% um, drop in. It was huge, really huge, in terms of what it meant for the tax base. So, so those are sort of the two things that I think of right now about, I mean, there's, you know, I totally support issues around housing because I think it's a big issue and I think the, the Prop 13 has something to do about that. I'm really, really worried about, I feel like the tax bill we just, that just got passed, the federal tax bill, is going to mean even much worse even than what Prop 13 has meant. Um, 
you know, it's gonna it's gonna be just devastating, and of course, um, poor people are gonna be more devastated than anyone else by it. So um, I'm, you know, I'm scared for that. It's like that she hasn't quite dropped yet, but it's it's coming. Um, so I, just one other quick thing about um, sort of an end story about um, the death penalty initiative is that um, what happened. Uh, later down the line was that um, the court, the state Supreme Court was the Rose Bird Court, and um, it was a very liberal Supreme Court. And she, um, she read the thing that John Briggs had written on the death penalty and said, this is like really stupid, makes no sense, it's not even legal, it's like, you know, this is garbage and we can't use it. Legally, we cannot use this. And so for several years, no one was put to death. And um, so a group organized in Southern California and did a recall campaign on three judges of the Supreme Court and succeeded because they were saying, you know, 74% of the people wanted this and who are you to, you know, you judges can't overrule the will of the people was the term they used a lot. And, um, and that succeeded. People went ahead and voted to recall these three bad judges who were not going by the, the will of the people. Um, and so those three judges, you know, Reynoso, Groton, and Rose Bird, were all um, recalled and removed from the court. Duke Nijin was governor, who was conservative, and he appointed three new, got to appoint three new conservative judges, and the Supreme Court was no longer a liberal majority anymore, which was a very big deal, because it had really protected us, and also a lot of other people. So um, just the backstory of what happened as a result of, you know, I'm not sure we could have won on the, the death penalty, but it would have been a lot less than 74%. Um, and, and then they wouldn't have been able to use that argument quite as much, I think. So, anyway. Yeah. 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 Howard Jarvis. Yes. 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 That's about the time that my family moved out from Indiana. California, in Southern California, out in Riverside County. And uh, so, very much remember those initiatives and the, the battles around them. And I wanted to say thank you for fighting uh, against the death penalty. Um, very important um, for a variety of reasons and very important to me personally. But I just wanted to add a, a couple of, of um, ideas to the, the, the conversation. That in terms of as we're looking at uh, class issues, class divide, um, class stratification within and about the LGBT um, continuum of, of, of folks and our experiences. I think I want to move a little bit out of just what happens in San Francisco. And I know that you will talk more on a national level. And I offer this in terms of uh, at least one uh, recent experience, and that was working on inclusion and diversity issues in uh, major companies for LGBT inclusion. Um, and certainly, I'm not suggesting that you know uh, our movement has to be predicated on everyone getting up and working for a Fortune 500 company. Uh, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't recommend that. But I do think that. As we look at our demographics and where we are, we're learning more about who we are, where we are, um, the Williams Institute and, and other um, key resources are providing us with that data, with, with the data, right, so that we can continue to make our cases uh, around a variety of, 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 of issues. Um, the census thing that's coming up is bullshit. Uh, in terms of not including or continuing to include um, some sort of way to uh, assess or to estimate 
um, where we are. Um, I chaired, or co-chaired the last census for San Francisco. Uh, and so we'll be looking what we need to be doing uh, for the next census, but I just wanted to start there in terms of knowing where we are, who we are, and what the perceptions are. Someone had mentioned earlier, Claire, you had mentioned one of the great myths, uh, misperceptions about what it means to be, uh, what it means to be LGBT, but particularly gay, um, has been a very persistent and perpetuated myth, and often a very self-perpetuated, so we have to own some of that in the LGBT community. Um, the Castro um, is, I think, one of the most wonderful places on the face of the earth. Uh, I've been a part of the community, have lived in the community for a number of years, but I am not blind to the fact that the Castro, at least idealistically to some folks, is really about a white gay man's playground. Okay? So let's get, you know, just putting it out there. So it's not, you know, it's not to, to castigate anyone. It is not about creating adversaries or blaming anyone. So let's, you know, at least acknowledge that. Now, I'm not saying this for the majority of folks. Uh, I think that people um, in general have more reasonable expectation. In fact, invite and celebrate real diversity. But in looking at where we are uh, nationally, do you know where the majority of LGBT identified folks, again through uh, resources such as the Williams Institute and other types of research to some degree through the, the last census, are located? People think that we are by majority located in places like, I mean, San Francisco's where less than a million people <laughs> that live here, so clearly the majority of any particular population just cannot possibly exist in San Francisco. But they think it's either San Francisco or certainly moving to the other coast, New York, um, maybe somewhere in the middle around uh, Chicago. The majority of us live in the south, in the southern states. Why is that important? <coughs> I think that that is important to understand um, because when we're looking at the issues of class and certainly as it, it, it interacts and is defined by issues of race and by gender, there are a number of elements at play in terms of it forces us to really see who and where we are. Make sense? So I think in looking at that, um, it takes us out of our urban environments. The majority of our movement, certainly we have, we have uh, the richest of riches history in terms of LGBT liberation that has taken place or has been taking place from this community uh, New York, Stonewall, other, other areas. But to me, the real movement is not in within these urban environments. It's in the suburbs, okay? It's in the rural communities where folks are living, again, when we're looking at some of those economic um, strata and challenges, people living below poverty, people making far less than minimum wage, uh, or barely making minimum wage for lesbians, um, women of color um, that are, you know, really hurting. It is not um, inconceivable for us, I think, to be thinking in terms of on that level, how do we reach out, organize, and learn from, not not one of these parachuting in, hey, I'm from San Francisco, we know everything, blah, blah, we got all our shit together, we here to, we here to enlighten you. We're not talking about colonizing uh, in the South. But I just want to put that out there in terms of what are the opportunities and ways in which we can be connecting um, beyond just what we're talking about in terms of the urban challenges. So, uh, I think that that's an important part when we're looking at class.
clearly when folks think about being open and gay and bisexual and transgender and you know all of the things that we certainly are uh, celebrating in San Francisco, struggling with like any like many other people in terms of just work a day, you know. Uh, the reality is, is that there's still going back to sort of that perception and that myth. I personally think that unless we're not really honest about it, again, it's not to castigate, it is not to create adversaries, it is not to punish or blame anyone. But I'm not going to sit here in the Castro and the GLBT historical society without acknowledging that. Okay? So there's that piece. In terms of, I think, the class issues and going back to some of the gender issues, in terms of what uh, uh, Claire was mentioning earlier, in terms of the numbers of, of trans brothers and sisters, particularly sisters, that are dying at the hands of, of, of other people simply because of who they are. Okay. Um, how do we continue and I think take that more seriously? I, for one, don't think that we take it seriously enough as a movement. We give a lot of lip service to it. We say well, that's terrible, that's a shame. We don't do shit about it. So, and why is that important in terms of class? Because what I think it also forces us to do is to look at some of our inter um, connectedness or disconnect. We have work to do in terms of accepting as equals within that continuum, within that rainbow, trans people and trans people of color. And so in the limitations and the challenges in terms of going back to um, this issue of, of, of looking beyond just our bubble here, not to say we don't have very critical and very urgent challenges, but I think that it is important to really make sure that we're looking at that and really working to support uh, policies within our, our the workplaces that are really truly about inclusion and diversity, but really about empowering people. We have no federal protections, okay? We have no federal, we don't have federal protection. In many states, um, again, how many states we got? We still got 50, right? I don't know what Trump's doing. He could have annexed, <laughs> you know, somebody, you know, uh, to France. He could have given Louisiana back to France while we were sitting here. But at any rate, um, as we look at this issue, in terms of not having any federal protections. So in other states, somebody says, you know what? I don't you know. I think he's gay. I think she's a dyke. I think she's trans. Fire her. Fire him. And you know what? That's just how it's going to go down. So this idea and you don't have any particular recourse within our constitutional structures beyond maybe the good policies of a company or an entity that says, you know what, those are not our values, that's not how we're going to operate, even if the state says it's not a good idea. Look what happened in the state of Indiana from our uh, now Vice President Pence. Remember a few years ago, you know, anti-LGBT, uh, legislative movement there, and folks like Mark Benioff said, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, go ahead and try it, brother. I will rip up every stake uh, that we have and move our people out. And so that particular movement, I think, is, is important. But I think it's important for looking at, as an example, trans folks of color. If we're not willing to organize seriously and stand up for the least, of our rainbow diaspora. Who are we kidding? So looking at, for instance, the federal level, 
You have no protection. It's not likely to happen under the, in this administration. On certain states, and especially in some of those southern states where, again, really the majority of us are, there are no protections in the workplace. And so people are subject to being um, either denied employment or fired from employment just because somebody suspects. That's a real problem. So to me, when we're looking at these class issues, um, it's really taking a good look in terms of what are the challenges in terms of the policies, in terms of the rights that we really need to be fighting for right now in the year 2018. So when we're looking at electing folks, when we're looking at, at um, uh, right now we're all hot and heavy in terms of what's gonna happen in November, you know, where primaries are coming up and all that. What are we asking of some of these officials? Now we may be a little bit different here in, in, in San Francisco, and that we've had some you know, pretty good representation of our issues in Washington, D.C. But that doesn't stop us from calling our friends, calling up HRC or whoever, and saying, we need to be asking these people that we are, that we are being uh, asked to support and get elected into the Congress and to the Senate. What are you going to do around federal protections for LGBT people? So, to me, that's um, one of the urgent matters that I would hope that we can spark some and ignite some some movement in action. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Julie Nice. I teach over at USF, um, and I'm. I'm, I'm really moved by the comments of, of each of you, and I'm grateful to have a chance to, to talk and share ideas because I've been doing anti-poverty and LGBTQ rights work for about 35 years. And uh, so there's a lot of synergies in what you each said that I wish we just had hours and hours to explore, but I'm sure you guys would all like a chance to talk to. So I'm gonna try to get to some key points here. First and most importantly, the LGBTQ community in the United States, San Francisco specifically, is simply typical within the United States. We don't care about poverty. Americans don't care about poverty. Poor people who live in poverty are the most vulnerable among us. We've heard the most vulnerable, the least among us. These phrases used so many times. But with all the myths of, you know, the myth of upward mobility, which there is almost no data left for, by the way, uh, within the United States, we, our community, like every community, ignores class and poverty for the, for the most part. It's just, it's just true. And I just was, little footnote, many people say, well, poverty is always going to be with us. So that's why, you know, there's really nothing we can do. We are, you know, the lowest ranked among advanced economies in terms of what we do about this, right? So this is not like inevitable, natural, you know, the state of nature, there's gonna be poverty and no one can do anything about it. Um, there was a reference to the war on poverty. We don't have a war on poverty, we have a war on poor people. Um, and, um, and I wanna link this to race. Um, the, the, uh, we had shared prosperity. When the, when the boats were lifted, however much they were lifted, the bottom went up whatever percent that the top went up. That was true in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And the civil rights movement, when especially you know, African Americans and other people of color demanded civil rights, including welfare rights, it was like the switch went off. Shared prosperity, if you look at the data, simply ended. And we've been growing uh, inequality ever since, growing the gap just as fast as we possibly can. So what I study in, within constitutional law is looking at how different social movements um, are treated, how they make constitutional claims, how they're treated by the courts. Uh, poor people, as you well know, have no political clout. What is polit political clout in the United States? Money, okay? So by definition, we know poor people have no political clout. And unfortunately, they have really no judicial protection. 
we in the LGBT community, even though, as Andrew's saying, we, we still have so far to go in trying to get a true federal floor of protection underneath us, we in the LGBT community are doing so much better in the courts than poor people have ever done, including all the way up to this very day uh, as we sit here. The idea that poor people might be a protected class is like considered a facetious claim in the courts, like laughable, right? You may remember that when, when we first said maybe we should not be criminalized, maybe same-sex sexuality should not be criminalized, the United States Supreme Court, uh, in that first case, Bowers v. Hardwick said that's a facetious claim, right? And then luckily, 17 years later, in Lawrence v. Texas, we got that overruled and we're decriminalized. But my point is, it's just not even considered to be a, a, an intelligible claim uh, within constitutional law that poor people might be protected by the courts from the just systemic suffering and discrimination. Uh, we are basically, basically poor people barely count at all. We've heard several people talk about counting, right? Uh, let's fight back and get counted is one thing. Uh, Claire said so many of you have, have used that uh, metaphor. The Williams Institute, which has been brought, up, uh, been brought up several times, has been absolutely key for LGBTQ issues to begin to say what are the lived experiences of people in the LGBT community and how can we get data about that? The data is so absolutely critically important. There, um, I've written extensively about this, but if you want just one very recent data point from the Williams Institute, right here in California, in the northern and mountainous regions of California, the proportion of LGBT people earning less than $24,000 per year is 34%. What is the percentage of poverty of LGBT, LGBTQ people in the South, 33%. LGBTQ people, 33% live in poverty in the South, 34% live in poverty in our northern and mountainous regions, right here in our state, right? Uh, so I don't think we have much to be, you know, uh, to walk around uh, with a lot of hubris about uh, from California. We have a lot of work to do. Um, most, several people have mentioned the special crisis of our LGBT youth. Uh, something else that uh, many of us have studied, I've written about, uh, to me, the, the systemic discrimination that LGBT youth face when they face rejection in their families and in their faith communities. They are uh, discriminated against in the child welfare system, in the juvenile justice system, in the schools, and they live a life of abject suffering on our streets. 40%, 49% in San Francisco uh, specifically, right? So uh, there's also, as you all know, uh, emerging data about the trauma of living in poverty and the epigenetic and neuro, uh, neurological changes that that causes uh, throughout for your health, et cetera. Um, so, you know, very important that we uh, finally look at these issues and all their intersections. Uh, but as was pointed out, Ruth pointed this out, uh, there's no social movement of poor people. Like, they're trying to survive out there, right? And they don't have the number one ingredient a social movement needs, which is the time to mobilize to uh, raise money, because they need political clout, and that's what they don't have. Uh, poverty is not so much an identity. There's not a movement for it. Um, and who understood this? Martin Luther King. Exactly, thank you so much. Who launched his Poor People's Campaign, uh, was on, you know, on the cusp of saying, there will never be racial justice until there is economic justice, okay? Um, so my concern is, as everyone has already said, is does our community get this? Yeah. Does our community get that there will never be sexual justice, there will never be gender justice, right. until there is economic justice? And I'm not sure that we do. Now, I do want to give some props to uh, you know, Urbishi Bay and the Bay Group have, and, and with some of the national organizations have recently launched. Uh, you can, if you just Google this, you can, you can pull up their study, the LGBTQ Poverty Collaborative. They're just basically trying to get data, gather experiences. Uh, they've, they've done sort of listening tours, if you'll let me use that phrase, around the United States. They did one in Oakland. Um, we have got to get economic justice on the LGBTQ agenda. Um, for both reasons, both because we should stand in solidarity with people who are economically suffering and huge proportions of our community are economically uh, suffering. Um, and I think it's just really important. So in politics, 
and in the courts, we've got to explain, we've got to articulate, we've got to demand, uh, uh, this, this notion of demand, uh, I think is uh, super important here, uh, we've got to demand economic justice. Think about, same-sex marriage was brought up, think about how constitutional litigation is used as a lever by social movement. Right? So who gets this? The anti-abortion movement gets this, okay? Uh, what they're doing, doing with the crisis pregnancy center litigation right now before the Supreme Court, et cetera. Constitutional litigation is just one of those levers. It mobilizes a sense of community. It mobilizes for rights and for protections. But it's exactly what is missing with regard to poverty. There is simply no money for this uh, movement, including constitutional uh, litigation. However, to me, there's one incredibly positive aspect of this, which is among our various identity movements, we're constantly trying to figure out, you know, how can we do race and sex and sexuality, right, and everything else? Like, how can we understand that none of us walks around with one aspect of our identity? We all have all of them. We have a race, we have a sex, we have a gender, we have a class, we have an ability status, we have an age, we have an immigration status. Right? We all have those things about us. And why do we slice them all off? And like, this is my movement. Just one little slice of me, that's my movement, right? Um, similarly, we, we have the holistic package of needs. We need employment, we need housing, we need health, right? We need all these things, right? But with poverty, here's the thing. Poverty is quintessentially intersectional, yeah. right? The bottom of every community is struggling. It could be, in fact, that one arena where we all come together, see our common alliance, and work really uh, in a way that would empower you know, human beings to not have to live with this kind of uh, uh, suffering. And that's certainly what I think we have to do. Now, we can, we've hearkened to many different people uh, who've been our leaders uh, in this movement, but I would also bring in uh, Frederick Douglass, right? So what did he teach us? Power never exceeds anything without a demand. And no demands are being made. Who does get this? The right wing gets this. Make no mistake about it. And let me just give you one example that's very much like uh, Prop 6, Prop 7, and Prop 13 that, that Ruth was mentioning here in that intersection. When the North Carolina bathroom bill went through, it not only denied bathroom access to our trans community, right? What else did it do? It, uh, it, it went for, also, no city in the state of uh, North Carolina can pass any protection with regard to sexual orientation. So they went from gender identity they made the pivot to sexual orientation. And what else did they say? Have you ever read it? I got, I, when I was really reading the whole bill, I was like, oh my gosh, no one's talking about this. And buried in it, what else did it say? And no city in the state of North Carolina can set or raise the minimum wage. Okay, right? So there it is for us, right? They get it. gender identity, sexual orientation, class, we're after you, right? And we have got to stay out of our siloed social movements. And I think poverty is an arena where we could come together. Unfortunately, we're fighting uh, the American uh, complacency on this issue. Uh, but the dire needs, which have been described here so eloquently by others, are out there. And eventually, we're going to have to wake up, right? And I think now's the time. So I hope that we can all share ideas about how to do that. I think it's long past time for you all to get a turn here. So I'll, I'll turn it over, uh, back over to Terry. Of economic theory, 
are capitalism and socialism, communism. Um, and of course, we don't really have any of those in, in a pure form anywhere. Um, and, but uh, in fact, we do have uh, somewhat of a hybrid here. But you know, the, the the right and the left seem to be focused around those certainly, and then there's the libertarian forces at you know, work as well. But uh, but politically, um, you know, how how does this come how does this come come to play for us? Uh, and and do we need to focus around ideology too in, in, in trying to articulate what it is that we're after? Because it seems, sort of seems like, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? We're kind of talking about sniffing around the edges and trying to pick up the scraps, um, making some slight adjustments to our legal framework, uh, changing the tax base in some tweaky way that might sort of trickle down to people to lift them up. And you know what? So and we're back in that place. We're in a scary time politically and nationally, certainly, and we're working within that framework where we're back to uh, shifting, uh, we're back to trickle down in economics, mm -hmm. and it's actually coming into effect more and more now, we're, we're gonna, and we're seeing its effect in our, our daily lives. So what is my question? My question is, <laughs> um, is it important for us to focus on ideological questions as well, and try to try to articulate what is our what is our take on that? Uh, do we need do we need an embracing sort of theory that we're moving toward, or um, or 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 are, is what we're doing right now effectively working to to uh, to um, uh, try to tweak the the legal system and to tweak the you know, tax uh, code and, uh, to uh, try to affect these changes. And I guess underpinning all this is where's the hope? You know, and what's it going to take? I mean, you know, when we've had big social changes and economic changes as, as a result of revolution, where people become so, the oppressed become so powerless that they rise up and claim their power. And you know, are, are we approaching that tipping point where we have, where we're going to have a massive social change? Or are we so complacent and we're not really even thinking about the fact that what we're working with is a capitalist system that is inherently unjust? Um, so, you know, those, those are my thoughts. Um, uh, and I uh, don't expect a solution, but. Can, can I just say, I, I, as, um, that's a really big question, Terry. Um, but it's the right question, I think. But I just, uh, and I just want to bite off a little tiny piece of that. I think that one of the things that um, I'm always um, uh, interested and fascinated in terms of the idea of sort of replicating, uh, importing, and adopting uh, models, social models um, that are taking place and economic models that are taking place in other countries. I spent some time in, um, I did a study abroad in Denmark, okay? Um, and I really went to Denmark because I was interested in Denmark, but it was a gateway for me to go to Russia at the time, which was at the time the USSR. <laughs> so that's a long time ago to go and um, explore uh, there as a student. But I uh, love Denmark, um, you know, Obviously, it was probably one of, from what I could tell on any given day, maybe four black people in the whole country. Uh, it was always really great when a good jazz band came to town. But <clears throat> this idea of sort of how we're able to replicate, when we look at it, for instance, Scandinavian, uh, Nordic uh, countries, their histories, their, they've had their challenges, certainly, in terms of um, dealing with various strife and atrocities and so on. But, and not to oversimplify, but one of the things I think that we often, we, we just we keep hitting our heads against is the fact that those countries, by and large, are still homogeneous. Things are certainly changing, right, as we become a more globalized, um, connected country and so on. But they still maintain a, a homogeneity about them, right? And they're, 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 the culture, the history, all of those things are um, 
celebrated and um, renewed in ways that in this particular country, uh, we're still dealing with um, um, vestiges around, uh, and when I say race, I'm not just talking about race, and I'm not just saying it's because I'm the African American in the room, but around slavery, okay? And so what it does is it sets up in terms of who is deserving and who is desirable. And in our psyche, not everyone is deserving and desirable. We're very clear on the hierarchy. We like to, you know, for, certainly those of us that um, um, would like to consider ourselves more enlightened or more you know, aggressive in our, in our thought and how we look, and I think that us coming together today is an expression of, of us um, celebrating diversity. But overall, when you look at what's happening, it's not those ideologies that you just described. It's the approach of authoritarianism that we are witnessing right now, the development of that. And so what allows for that to occur is the festering and the picking at that scab in terms of how we pit people against each other. Okay. So before I think getting to the grand idea of our ideological um, is this ideological approach better or whatever, or how do we have a hybrid, etc. cetera? The, the, if we are, however, um, not still able to really kind of move further past, it's like you said, the civil rights movement, we may not be where we want to be, but thank the Lord we ain't where we used to be. So that's where the hope is. We are always moving forward. But I think that in terms of looking at some of those other types of ideological principles and their application within our society, I'm not saying that they won't take, but I don't think that they're as, as replicable as we would like, um, and I think would probably work better for us in many ways. Look at Obamacare. Okay, so you know, a lot of it is really the aversion to uh, folks that don't think that these folks deserve. <coughs> they haven't worked for it, they don't merit it, and they're not valued. Why am I getting up and going to work and paying for you to have health care? Okay. So I just want to put that on the table. I think that that's also a very important element in terms of this discussion around class. And class is about who is deserving and who is not deserving, who is desirable and who is not desirable. Those are very basic sociological definition of the situation issues. And so I think that we still are, we're, we're again, getting better at it, but unless we're, um, what we'll ask for an authoritarian um, evolution, or what, what, what we see happening, I think if we're paying attention, is the allowance of those kinds of of, uh, of, of uh, divisions? So, uh, and I just a follow up question on that, and I, I think that uh, Julie uh, spoke to this specifically. But what we're talking about um, with um, uh, trying to engender a, a war on poverty, or trying to equalize mm -hmm. um, economic justice. Uh, we're talking about political power. Um, poor people do not have the political power. Um, you know, we have, the, of course, the Supreme Court decision, which allowed uh, corporations to give unlimited amounts of money to political campaigns, uh, individual donations, and all and all of that. And so, which just perpetuates the 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 the, uh, the lack of political power among people that have no money. And so. Um, so, I, so I, 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 this is a point that I, I think I want to bring up. Um, in, um, somebody posted on Facebook specifically in San Francisco that we heard about Conway and uh, how he funds PACs and plays a political role in creating, uh, uh, you know, affecting elect election outcomes in San Francisco that perpetuate uh, uh, economic policies that continue to disenfranchise the poor and drive uh, people of color um, and poor people out of San Francisco. 
Um, and, and yet it's permitted within the social justice framework. And so I guess really the bigger question for me, we're in the queer museum and you know, what is our role around this as a queer community in terms of advocating for uh, the voice of the political power of poor people, specifically around <coughs> campaigns and around uh, political donations? Does anyone want to talk about that? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say that it's not completely true that poor people don't have, aren't organizing or, 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 or aren't building power. Um, <coughs> If you look at homelessness in San Francisco, and you look at how the city dealt with people on the streets and the sweeps 10 years ago versus how it is now, they're much more careful. The way they frame it, they say, well, we're referring people to shelters, and we're making sure that people get into a navigation, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it, and that's because of the Coalition on Homelessness, that's because of RAP, and that's because poor people and homeless people have organized and have made the system at least bend a little bit and move a little bit more to at least being a little more considerate of their uh, of them and, and, and their lives. It's certainly not enough, <coughs> at least they will now. But it is happening. There's a statewide movement called Right to Rest, which is a movement that would repeal all sit and lie and all kinds of other laws like that and give people the right if they're tired to sit down on a sidewalk or on a bench. Remember they removed the benches at Harvey Plaza because homeless people were sitting on them. I mean, fucking give me a break here, you know? And the, the thing is, if you're homeless and you're in a shelter, seven o'clock in the morning, you're out of that shelter and you can't come back till seven o'clock at night. What do you do all that time? Where do you go? You know, if you're tired, what do you do? You know, people don't consider that. But people are organizing around. There's a whole right to, to rest movement in California, you know, that, that is lobbying in Sacramento. So, and then there's high tents who are some of the poorest people okay. in public so, housing. So there's political grassroots organizing, but that's... And we should be part of that. With. We should be part of that. So you ask, what should we do as a queer community? We should be part of that, of that grassroots movement. And we should be allies with them and working with them because we have such a great problem with poverty and homelessness in our community. So that's one thing we could all be doing. Uh, Equality California could be part of that movement, could be a part of the rap movement, the right to rest. So could HRC. You know, so so could all of our groups. So that's one way we can help to to to, to these movements to have more power in Sacramento. Okay, great. And we should be doing it. Um, I'm going to open up because we have 20 minutes left, oh, and okay. I promise to leave a little bit of time for some questions. <laughs> um, I saw your hand over here. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. I got here about an hour late. Um, I wanted to address the fact that um, someone mentioned that here the that there's a lot of divided conflict. In this authoritarian regime that we're in. And that happens within our community too. It's mm happening -hmm. right here in San Francisco. We tolerate as we are one another. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're really not. And I'm sick of the word tolerance to me, but I don't want to tolerate. No, I want to love. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it, it's happening right here. And it was Howard Sand who said, change has to come from the top, it comes from the bottom. And any Changes we've had in society are because people rebel and vote. Yeah. And that's happening now. You know, Trump has, in effect, kind of you know, um, brought people out, like women's marches, you know, gun marches. Mm -hmm. And it is happening. There is a resistance happening. But I think you've mentioned too that um, the complacency, I think, comes out of people are tired, they feel helpless. Mm -hmm. And they feel like there's really nothing they can do. Because mm -hmm. if, if, if it even happens to me, because I read a lot, and it's overwhelming mm -hmm. what's going on. Besides what led us to this, the regulation of capitalism for decades. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, um, and people are, are, you know, they're poor, they're struggling. You know, both, both mom and dad have to work, and things don't necessarily do that way. And, you know, raising kids, and really they don't have the time to, like, even read about going on, much as get out there and march or call the Congress people or do that kind of stuff. But um, I think it's also true, though, that we do need a new movement. Well, out of the 60s and 70s, a lot, you know, there's a lot of combinations of things, civil rights, gay rights, women's rights, but there are also a lot of poor people there within those, you know, sectors. And a couple of years ago, um, I lost my place, I was homeless. 
I was at um, the only OIMC building that I currently converted into a picture group. St. Anthony's was right down the street. They were, re they were reopening into a new building. And they had a, a stage, and people were there, not a lot of them, and they had music playing. And DJ, all the songs they were playing, except, except maybe one, were from the 60s and 70s. There were lots of anthems back then. We don't have as many anthems going on right now. <laughs> and you know, part of what helps, I think, motivate people is um, culture. And music for me is special. And I think we need more of that to be happening too, to bring people together, uh, you know, the whole blood rainbow, okay? And, um, you know, yeah. I'm just trying to draw to a question if you have one. Mm -hmm. Pardon? If you have a question. Um, uh, my question just comes down to, like, what, what can we do here? Um, um, I think what has to be done in this time is, um, city by city, state by state, make the changes we need to make, and then, you know, go higher up the, you know, to the federal level from there. What can we do here, um, you know, to, to bring people more together again? Yeah, I mean, I think one strategy, um, not to, I was hoping you were gonna bring this up before me, but, <laughs> But one thing Andrea says to me a lot is like the state of emergency around housing. And um, we um, have been working as part of the D8 um, collaborative, um, which the mayor brought an additional 2.5 million to support um, youth housing for LGBT um, homeless folks, um, street outreach, as well as um, additional stipends to provide um, housing uh, stipends, but one model that um, HUD, um, the federal government, is actually going to be funding is a host home model, and I think really thinking about what can we do as individuals is important, and the host home model really allows folks who are homeowners, and we know that um, with the continued restrictions on um, vacation rentals in the district and throughout the city that there's more folks that have space available and so we need to make sure that those spaces are available to rent and that if we have this host home model which is in development um, for young people is how can we open up those spaces um, whether it's an extra room or a living room to house our community and I think if we don't make choices to be a part of that change then we're not really being a part of um, the solution. Thank you. I just mentioned that. Yeah, the host home model I think is really important because it also is demonstrating a different type of innovative approach. We have to look at for innovative approaches to, um, you know, not uh, not to say that some of the approaches are are dispensable or uh, obsolete or not effective in working, but I think that sometimes we have a lack of a sort of alignment in terms of different frameworks in terms of how we're going to work to solve um, and address some problems. Um, so I do think that, and I'm, uh, I've been a really big proponent, has been, have been just bugging Claire and anyone who would listen around this host homes piece, and so we're very glad that we're able to bring that to San Francisco. So what that basically what that means is it's sort of um, you know it's a matching um, where someone that is in need of uh, transitional housing or temporary housing and if you have a room if you have a, a place an in law or whatever in your house as a homeowner uh, and say we'll make that available and then um, you know to 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 someone there will be programming there'll be you know this person's probably already receiving some sort of services, case management, etc., to help them move along towards uh, eventually self-sufficiency. And so we would be partnering and pairing people. It's kind of like the, um, uh, you know, not only say foster care situation because that, that, that's not what it is, but it's for people that are offering space that they have available. Um, I know people that have their kids are off, they're, you know, at college or whatever, they have a space, maybe uh, their bedroom or whatever that can be used. And so really working with people, screening people, working with, um, with the host and with the, 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 the person who's placed for a period of time and as they're receiving services to, to uh, eventually hopefully be able to move 
move forward. Um, but I just want to say one thing that I noticed that neither of us really mentioned um, really quickly is the issue of labor organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's it, it would be remiss to walk out of this room without mentioning the, the, the decimation of the labor movement. It was a labor movement that really brought a number of these um, uh, our, our, our uh, diverse experiences together. Not singularly the labor movement, but certainly the, the so the loss of a real labor movement. That's poor people's <coughs> movement. That's, a, that's an aspect of a type of poor people's movement. It doesn't wholly encapsulate the poor people's movement, but nonetheless, that was the closest thing that we had had uh, to a, um, a, a poor people's movement and um, so I just wanted to at least interject that in terms of the role of labor. We don't have the same um, uh, labor movement. I'm not saying the labor movement is dead, but that is clearly very much related to the economic uh, um, uh, situation in which we're in. And clearly it's related to some of the ideological issues that you were talking about before, but nonetheless, Labor is not the way that it was before. I'm from Indiana. I come from working class, poor folks, upper middle class, all kinds of people. We got all kinds of things going on. But what most of my folks were either if they didn't work for uh, government, uh, they worked in car factories. You better be driving a Chrysler. My father um, was an old Indiana bell man. Um, my mother, you know, so everyone, my, my, uh, my grandfather was firefighter. Um, still to this day, all of us banking credit unions. And then folks have been involved um, with their labor communities. So that I think is another um, elephant in the room. That is a piece that, that was really talking about sort of intersectional, addressing our economic um, uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And then um, certainly we, there's, we've gone for days in terms of how that decimation has occurred. Um, but yeah. yeah, I've been excited to see the teacher strike happening. Yeah. Right, that's great. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I think that's really. Because I, I mean, I just think about how poorly my friends who are school teachers are paid, yeah. um, and uh, which speaks to also just the schools, you know, the schools in, in, in California. Um, Can I just add to that? The, the thing about hotels, Claire, is um, number one, a lot of SRO hotels, they're transforming rooms into tech spaces, and they're renting rooms for $1,200. Hotels. Um, we said oh, host. Host. Oh, host. Oh, yeah, this is a yeah, so yeah. hotels are a problem that we're not No, we're not. Yeah. That, this is not a. Hotel. Is the hosting actually happening though? No, it's a grant. The a, a grant through HUD. We just that. submitted a grant yeah. about three weeks ago. Yeah. Who's who's we? What's the like the so the the that LGBT LGBT center, center Larkin okay. Street. Larkin Street. Yeah. Are we able to make up with that? Like yeah. you know, an individual <coughs> host, how much money will they be making? Yeah, we'll they will be making. Okay. All right. So we're looking for other ways in which to supplement or uh, other incentives. Is there any bidding for hosts? Yeah. We haven't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have to be. Are they going to charge mm -hmm. according to HUD standard, 30% of income? Are they what? Are they going to charge rent according to HUD standard, 30% of income? They won't charge them. Oh, they're not charging them, they're hosting right. for free. Right. So, so they, they said, at this point, the application end has been is sort of more the conceptual piece, and we're not out, um, you know, what the details yeah. are in terms of how you will make for the city, yeah. And so there are other cities that have done that, that are doing it. So it's kind of a, a, a new model, so to speak, to some extent. The, the faith communities, you know, in terms of refugee populations, so we have several models, perhaps without some of the government assistance. Um, Minnesota, um, they're actually trying to get out in, or uh, Minneapolis, trying to get out also, sorry, in Santa Clara County uh, at our, uh, LGBT Center there, uh, Bill, um, I haven't, haven't had dinner yet. But anyway, so we're part of the um, pilot thing of that. Mm -hmm. Can you have another hand in the back? Are there any advantages?
defenses or protections that I mean, you know, within uh, zoning laws or uh, air rights or affordable housing versus low income housing that you can I maybe mean, talk about? I'm not sure I understand the question, sorry. Just overall zoning laws within the city. Um, a lot of the spaces are separated within right. commercial or residential or industrial, mm -hmm. and that affects, you know, mm -hmm. overall how many people we can house in. San Francisco or anywhere in the world. So any advances that any of you guys know or may be aware of yeah, we'd like to talk that's about. That's a continual battle that's been going on for a long time. Um, you know, I think that there was the attempt by Weir with the 827 to allow all this density and stuff, but that's dead. That's thankfully dead right now, so it's a bad bill. But I think also um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of complicated, that would be a much, much, much longer discussion.